Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Jessica De Silva. I'm an assistant professor of mathematics at California State University Stanislaus, and I'm very much looking forward to talking to you today about some open questions related to Erdős Corrado graphs. To start things off, I wanted to give you an idea of what research questions look like in this specific area of graph theory that I um, have worked in. And that specific area is extremal graph theory. So think of um, whenever you learned about extreme values in calculus, maximum and minimum values, we're sort of taking those same ideas and questions and translating them to graph theory. So one of the things that I really love about extremal graph theory is how simple it is to generate a research question. And it is so simple that you can capture uh, the steps in a simple three-step process, which I'm gonna talk to you about uh, right now. So in extremal graph theory, uh, there exists a simple three-step process that you can use to create a research question in this area. For the first step, what you'll want to do is select your favorite graph parameter. Select your favorite graph parameter. Maybe that's number of triangles, maybe that's size of an independent set. There are many different options for what we can choose here. So just pick your favorite. Step two, you'll want to decide whether or not you are going to maximize or minimize the graph parameter that you chose in step one. Decide whether to maximize or minimize the parameter. And that's where the extremal part comes into play, right? We wanna maximize or minimize. Now for certain parameters, it may make sense to only do one of these two things, either maximize or minimize that parameter. But for some parameters, uh, both questions are actually interesting as well. Step three is optional. But the point of step three is that it sort of narrows your search in the types of graphs that you are considering. So what we'll do in step three is we will restrict some properties of the graphs you consider. So some typical ideas for step three would be to fix the number of vertices or fix the number of edges or fix both, fix the number of vertices and the number of edges or um, have a lower bound on the minimum degree or an upper bound on the maximum degree. So those are all great options that we can use um, for restricting the types of graphs we are considering in our research question. So once we've nailed down these three steps, we have a graph parameter, we decided whether to maximize or minimize it, and we kind of narrowed down the types of graphs we are gonna consider, we can formulate our research question with this fill in the blank structure that I have here. So our research question is, among all graphs with whatever restrictions you're putting on the graphs that you're considering, which have the maximum or minimum, whichever you decided, value of that graph parameter you selected. Let's try out some options here. So let's say I'm not gonna put any restrictions on the graphs I'm looking at, uh, but I want to minimize the value of the number of triangles that the graph has, okay? So I have formulated a research question in extremal graph theory, and now we get to start thinking about answers to it, right? And so it may not take you long to decide that um, we can quickly find an answer to this question by basically ensuring that the graph has no triangles. Um, and you can do that in many ways, including just have a graph with no edges at all. 
So because that question ended up being um, a little too easy, one option is to place some restrictions on the graphs you consider so that I can't just say, oh, have no edges in the graph, right? So maybe I'm going to fix the number of edges in the graph. So maybe I want M edges in the graph, okay? Maybe M edges and maybe I also want to fix the number of vertices. Another option is I could say that I want to consider all graphs that have minimum degree at least three. And so there the answer isn't as obvious, right? So if I'm requiring my minimum degree to be at least three, then how can I minimize the number of triangles? So um, this is the general structure for many questions in extremal graph theory. And the question that we're going to be looking at today follows a similar format. So I'm going to go ahead and scroll down. And the format is just a little bit different. So what we're asking here is among all graphs with a certain restriction. And the restriction that I'm going to place on my graphs is just that we're fixing the number of vertices. So n vertices. So among all graphs with n vertices, which have stars, so I need to tell you what a star is, but whatever these stars are, satisfy that they have the maximum value of the number of intersecting size R independent sets. Ties are independent sets. Okay, and so I also need to tell you what does it mean for um, a set of independent sets to be intersecting, but this is the main question that we are looking at today. So among all graphs with a fixed number of vertices, we are trying to figure out which graphs satisfy this extremal property, that the thing that maximizes this graph parameter is a star. So it does have a little bit of a different format than our original question, but it has kind of the same, um, the same theme. So now let's go ahead and focus on understanding this second question that I've posed here. And we are going to start by defining what do we mean by having um, sets that are intersecting. To define this, let's start first with a family. So script F is a family. A family of sets. So it's basically just a subset of the power set of some finite set S. Okay, so script F is just a set of sets, okay? Then a subfamily, so a subset of script F is called intersecting. So a set of sets is intersecting if every pair of sets in that subfamily have non-empty intersection. So every pair of sets in this set of sets has at least one common element. So let's go ahead and try an example. Let's see if we can construct um, an intersecting subfamily. I'm gonna start first with defining my, um, my family script F. And let's say that script F is the power set of the set of integers from one to five. So script F has all sets that contain either no elements or whose elements are an integer from one to five. Now let's try to construct an intersecting subfamily of script F. One option is, so remember a subfamily is a set of sets. So one option is we could start with, let's say the set one, two, five. And so the next set that I put in script A needs to have at least one element in common with this first set that I've put in here. So let's say that the second element is two, four. 
So we're good there because um, we have that both of these sets contain the element two, right? And let's see if we can fit one more in here. Let's do one and four. So I needed to make sure that whatever set I chose here had a common element with both sets, right? So every pair of sets in this um, subfamily has non-empty intersection. So one thing to note is that um, these subfamilies are going to be restricted in the size of sets that they will contain. So we will restrict the size of each set Um, in script F, so in our family, our large family, to R. So R is going to be the size of each set in this set, this family, script F. So what that would mean is that uh, script A won't have sets of different sizes. Every set in script A will have the same size, size R. And so the notation that we'll use for that um, these sets uh, from script F that are only of size R will be script F and then in the superscript parentheses R. So now let's try this again. Let's find an intersecting family script A that instead is a subset of script F um, with only elements, with only sets of size two. So A contains sets of size two whose elements are integers from one to five, okay? Let's start with just a random pair of numbers for our first set. Let's just do one and two, okay? And so then my second set also needs to be size two and it needs to have a common element with this first set. So that means it either has one or two in it and one new number so that it has size two, right? So let's say that um, it contains two and also three. So three is the new number. Okay, now I have these two sets down. Let's see if I can make a third set that would be intersecting with both of them. Let's say that this set has one and three in it. Oops, one and three. The other option we had was two and four or two and five, right? So now looking at our set script A, it is intersecting so far. Let's see if we can add one more set to it. So I need um, uh, two numbers that have either, so it needs to either be that it has one or two. So let's do two. And it can't be one, two or two, three. So it's either two, four, or two, five, right? Those are the only two sets of size two that contain two that haven't been used yet. But both of those, two, four, and two, five, uh, don't intersect with this one right here. So that's not gonna be a good option. Let's try one. So if we chose one, then it intersects here, but it doesn't intersect with this set yet. So we neither either put a two or a three in it. Now one, two is already used, so it must be one, three, but we already have one, three as well. So with the sets that we have chosen, this is as large as script A can get. But um, I did make a choice here, right? I chose one, three as my third set, but I had two other options. So my question is, could we have created a larger intersecting subfamily if I had chosen one of those two other sets? And the answer is actually yes. Yes. If I had chosen two, four, so let's say I still have these first two sets, one, two, two, three, oops, two, three, and I chose two, four, then I also could have put in two, five. And actually that would have been the only set that would have worked 
to make sure that this entire uh, subfamily was intersecting. So how is it easy for me to see that this subfamily is intersecting? It's simple to see because every set in script A has a common element of two. I have two in all four of these sets. So then if I intersect any pair of sets, I know that at least two is in the intersection. The number two is in the intersection. So this is one efficient method uh, to create an intersecting subfamily. You just look at your family and pick out all sets that contain a given element. And we actually have some notation for this. So instead of calling this script A, we would actually call this script F, parentheses two in the superscript, because it's still, we're taking from um, script F where all the elements have sub sets of size two. And we are picking all of those sets that contain the number two. Okay, so then we would have a two down here to represent that we picked all sets that contain two that are of size two. And these specific subfamilies are called stars. So I have that definition here. This type of uh, method for creating subfamilies is called a star. And so you're picking um, all sets in your family of a fixed size that contain a fixed element X. And so you denote that star subfamily by script F um, in the superscript, you have the size of the sets. And in the subscript, you have the element that is in every set in your subfamily. So these are called stars. If we think back to our question that we're studying here. Stars are what um, satisfy some extreme little property that we're gonna get to in a minute, okay? So we are looking for graphs where stars satisfy some extreme little property. So what we saw here was that the star was larger in size than this intersecting subfamily that we were trying to create on our own, right? And it's actually the case that this star is largest in size. So I wouldn't be able to find another intersecting set that wasn't a star of some, of some number that had as many elements in it as, um, as this one does. So all other intersecting families that are not stars have size three or less in this situation. And this theorem called the erdos corrado theorem generalizes that fact. So if our family is a power set of um, the set of numbers, the set of integers from one to n, then any intersecting subfamily whose elements have size r is no larger than a star, and um, any star, in fact with this restriction that n is at least twice the size of the sets in the intersecting family. So this wasn't just a special case for um, when n was five and r was two, this actually does generalize quite a bit. And again, from this erdos corrado theorem. And this theorem is actually going to um, lead us into talking about erdos corrado graphs. So the idea with erdos corrado graphs, it's related to this theorem above. The theorem above is saying that the family that we are considering is the power set of the set of integers from 1 to n. And instead, when we're thinking about erdos corrado graphs, we are considering a different family. And this is a family whose sets are related to a graph. So the question is, is there an erdos corrado result when the family is the set of independent sets 
of a graph G. So now I can't just pick any set that contains the integers from one to n. Instead, I'm only picking sets that are independent sets from a fixed graph. So this family has a specific, um, has specific notation tied to it. So since it's talking about independent sets of a graph G, we're gonna use scripty I of G to denote this family. So again, this is the set of independent sets of the graph G. And this is where we are able now to define an erdos corrado graph. Thinking about how here we are saying that stars maximize the size of, of subfamilies that are intersecting, here we're kind of saying the same thing except for our subfamilies are coming from this family here of independent sets. So our definition, a graph G is R erdish corrado if for any intersecting subfamily coming from the set of independent sets of size R of the graph G is no larger than some star. And R star at V is the set of all independent sets of size R that contain some vertex V. Going back to our research question, we were asking for which graphs do stars maximize the size of an intersecting subfamily coming from the set of independent sets of a graph. And so we are saying that if a graph satisfies that property with some fixed size, set size R, then we are going to call that graph R erdos corrado, R E K R. Now, many graphs have been proven to be R E K R for various values of R. And so I'm gonna give you a couple of those graphs, but just know that there are many more than what I have written here. So the erdos corrado theorem itself actually proves that empty graphs of on n vertices are um, are erdos corrado when n is at least so the number of vertices is at least two r. So that result itself was proven before our erdos corrado uh, graphs were even defined, but in itself, if we apply it to this context, does give us a result in this world as well. Bolabosch and Letter proved that the disjoint union of at least R copies of a complete graph is also R erdos corrado, um, as long as the complete graphs are all the same size and are of size at least two. Uh, Talbot proved that powers of cycles are R erdos corrado for all R, um, from 1 to n, and Holroyd and Talbot proved the same thing, but for powers of paths, and then Holroyd and Talbot uh, also together proved that the disjoint union of at least R complete graphs of order at least 2 is R erdos corrado. And so uh, that's not restricting that all the complete graphs have the same size. But there are many more um, graphs that have been shown to be R E K R for various values of R, such as ladder graphs and things like that. But I just wanted to give you an idea of um, some graphs that have been considered. Many graphs that have been proven to be R E K R are typically some graph with an isolated vertex. So that's one approach as well. But in thinking about all these different graphs that are R E K R, we're trying to think about, okay, how can we sort of characterize these graphs. And um, Holroyd and Talbot, they have obviously done a lot in this area, uh, have a conjecture that has yet to be proven or disproven. And the conjecture states that if we are considering the minimum size of a maximal independent set of a graph, what we're gonna call that mu. So we have an independent set that there is no other vertex that I could add to it and create a larger independent set. So that's what we mean by maximal. So of all of these maximal independent sets, uh, pick the one that has the smallest size. And so that size is mu of G. And the conjecture states that um, a graph, so any graph is R E K R 
as long as r, the size of these independent sets that are in this intersecting family, r is no more than half of mu. Thinking back to the EKR theorem, um, what that means for empty graphs would be that, well, uh, mu of g for empty graphs is just the number of vertices because all maximal independent sets are, uh, well, there's only one and it's the independent set that contains all the vertices, right? So mu of g would be n and the EKR theorem does state that that inequality holds only when r is uh, no larger than half n, right? So at least this theorem makes sense when we apply it to sort of where this a concept originated from in the EKR theorem. So this conjecture has been um, sort of long studied and long worked on and uh, Talbot has this idea that if there was a counterexample to this conjecture, then uh, Talbot believes that it would be a well-covered graph. That would be the smallest counterexample that uh, we would find. Talbot believes, Talbot believes that if this conjecture weren't true, the smallest counterexamples would be well-covered graphs. And I'll let you know what well-covered graphs are in just a moment. Would be well-covered graphs. So what is a well-covered graph? The general idea of a well-covered graph is that the maximal independent sets of a graph, of the graph, are also maximum in size. So if we had um, a number, which was the maximum size of an independent set, then all of the maximal independent sets would have that maximum size. And so that's exactly what the definition states. So we're gonna let alpha of G be the maximum size of an independent set, independent set. Of G, then G is well covered if the minimum size of a maximal independent set is equal to the maximum size of an independent set, which again just means that all maximal independent sets are also maximum in size. So Talbot believes that these well-covered graphs would be the ones that are, I guess, the smallest graphs that break this conjecture. So one thing that we should be thinking of then is, well, let's just study well-covered graphs and see if they are, if we can prove that they are EKR, or if we can disprove that they are EKR. And so that means that we kind of really need to understand well-covered graphs and their properties. And so uh, Finbo and Hartnell proved that most well-covered graphs are actually pretty easy to understand. And so this is their theorem. So if you have a connected graph with girth at least six, so girth is the uh, minimum size of a cycle, an induced cycle in the graph. So if your graph has girth at least six, uh, and is connected, then as long as we're not considering the cycle on seven vertices or the, the graph with just one vertex, then the graph is well covered if and only if the pendant edges form a perfect matching. The pendant edges are edges that are connected to a vertex of degree one. So if we considered all of those pendant edges, it would make a perfect matching. And there's actually a much better way to kind of understand um, what these specific types of well-covered graphs look like than using this idea here. So basically, as an example, take any graph. And so I'm gonna take um, the graph, which is the path on five vertices. So take any graph 
and then at each vertex, glue a pendant edge. At each vertex, we're gonna glue an edge that is connected to a vertex of degree one. So for trees, a pendant edge is an edge that's connected to a leaf, okay? So these are the pendant edges, and so you have one at each vertex. And then down here, you have your base graph, which for us right here is P5. So I take any graph, and then at each vertex, I'm gonna glue on this pendant edge. And this gives you um, these well-covered graphs that are being described in this theorem. Because again, if I just consider these pendant edges that I create, then that is a perfect matching on the entire graph, right? So I could even take this graph and apply pendant edges to every vertex and get a new graph that is also well covered, right? And so we just have to be careful of these um, things here. So the path is uh, has girth infinity because it doesn't have any cycles. So it definitely satisfies this. It's connected and it's not uh, C7 or K1. So if your path, if your base graph satisfies these properties, then when you add pendants to it, uh, that resulting graph will also satisfy those properties. So that's one thing that's nice to know. We just wanna make sure that the base graphs that we start with have girth at least six um, and are connected. So many well-covered graphs look like this. You take a graph and you stick on pendant edges at every vertex. So then the question now becomes, can we study the R erdos corrado ness of these types of graphs? So graphs that are created in this way. So I'm gonna start off with some notation here. If I have a graph G, then G star is going to be this sort of pendant graph that I'm creating where G is the base graph. So think of it as G with pendants at each vertex. And so one thing to note, thinking about the fact that the conjecture is only supposed to hold when R is at most mu over two. So what is mu for these types of graphs? And the fact is that mu of G star is equal to the number of vertices in the base graph. So this is a fun fact to think about and try to just prove in your head when you have a couple of minutes, but um, just that's an important thing to note since we are considering mu whenever we're thinking about this conjecture. So now let's rephrase our question, kind of narrowing it down a little bit, right? So we wanna know now for which graphs G can we prove G star is R E K R. Either for one R, for some R, or for all R that we're considering, right? R at most mu of G star over two, which using this fact is the number of vertices in G over two. So for which graphs can we prove that G star is R E K R for some R? The typical strategy um, for all graphs, not just these like pendant graphs that we're considering is the following. The first thing we do is we want to figure out a vertex whose star is the largest, okay? Because what we're looking for is we are trying to say that all the intersecting subfamilies are no larger than some star. So then which star is the largest then? Because we can say then all intersecting subfamilies are no larger than this particular star. So determine a vertex a vertex V whose 
r star is largest or has maximum size okay and then once i figure that out typically to prove r e k r ness of g i'm going to induct on the number of vertices and define an injection where I can sort of partition these independent sets using that G minus V to the graph where I remove the vertex V and G without V and its neighborhood. So those are both graphs on fewer vertices. And since I'm inducting on the number of vertices, I get to use in the proof uh, that they're both R, E, K, R themselves. R, E, K, R. And in fact, they actually induct on N and R simultaneously. So it may actually be useful to not only use that um, their R, E, K, R, but also maybe R minus one, E, K, R, R minus two. Um, thinking about it like that. So this typical strategy has two things in it that are um, needing to be proven, right? So let me kind of take us back a couple of steps. What we have started off asking is which graphs are R Erdős Karada? And in that question, we have this conjecture that graphs that are R Erdős Karada um, satisfy that R is less than or equal to mu over two. Talbot thinks that um, that conjecture, if it's not true, would have a counterexample that is a well-covered graph where the um, mu is equal to the size of the largest independent set of a graph. So mu is equal to alpha. And then we have that theorem, which kind of characterized a lot of well-covered graphs. It's um, that well-covered graphs are typically like a graph with these pendant edges um, attached to all of the vertices of that base graph, right? So then what we want to know is, okay, for which graphs can we prove that that sort of pendant graph is our Erdős Karada? And the strategy is typically we try to figure out which vertex has um, the star that's the largest, and then we induct from there. So we've narrowed our, our question down from something that's pretty grand to something that's a little bit more specific. And I'm gonna push this a little bit further. So um, for me, my institution is a primarily undergraduate institution. And so I try to think of questions that are accessible to undergraduates. And even at our institution, we don't have a graph theory class. So um, I want it to be something where the ideas are also um, pretty quick to understand uh, in order to start working on the problem. So I think that this is a great problem. Um, of course, proving that graphs are R Erdős Karada is, uh, would be fantastic, but I am going to suggest that if you are working with undergraduates, that just working on this first part is a great start and would help people improving our Erdős Karada ness um, of those graphs then, right? So this is a nice first step that I think is um, really accessible to undergraduates. So that's going to be my main question here. So given a graph, G, which vertex in its pendant graph, G star, has the maximum size R star, right? And so that may depend on R, right? And again, we're um, restricting R to be no larger than half the number of vertices in G. There is a question about maximal stars um, when we just focus on not even these pendant graphs, but when we just focus on trees. For trees, which vertex has the largest star? And there's a conjecture out there by Hurlbert and Kamat 
uh, that has yet to be proven or disproven. And the conjecture is that if G is a tree, then there is a leaf that has the largest, um, the largest star size for a, gig, a fixed number R, right? And so a leaf you can think of as, it's just a pendant, it's just a specific word that we use for trees, um, but it is just a pendant. So there exists some pendant that um, has the largest size of an R star. And recently in September of 2020, Estrugo and Pistine has proved the following theorem towards this conjecture. And the theorem um, talks about these escape paths from a vertex to a pendant vertex um, and kind of the relationship between the size of their stars if an escape path exists. But the main thing that I want to take from this theorem is that there's actually a related corollary So just a direct result from this, and that is that there exists a pendant vertex of G star whose R star is largest. And that is because thinking about these escape paths, in our pendant graph that we're creating, every vertex has an escape path to some pendant vertex. So um, there is a pendant vertex whose R star is the largest. And what I wanna know is, okay, I know there is a pendant vertex whose R star is the largest, but which one? <laughs> which one or which ones? Right. I want to know just not just like what type of vertex it is, but I want to know exactly which vertex it is. So then I've narrowed my question down even more uh, to say which pendant vertex has a, the largest R star. And so I want to then pick a base graph or a family of base graphs to consider and hopefully be able to prove which pendant vertex or vertices have the largest R star. And so my conjecture uh, that I have yet to prove, but I believe is true, just with some sort of programming evidence that uh, I have generated, is that when the base graph is a path, which was the example that I gave whenever we first talked about the theorem about well-covered graphs, when the base graph is a path, so let me give an example, then my graph looks like this. I have my path and then every node on the path has a pendant and so which pendant or, or which vertices uh, that are on the pendants have the largest R star and I believe that it is this one so the second second outermost vertex that is a pendant vertex uh, on both sides actually. Hopefully it makes sense that um, if it was one of these then it would also be the sort of identical one if we were to just flip the graph because if we flip the graph this way we'll get the same exact graph right. So that's my conjecture. Um, there are of course many other uh, ways that you can take this question and create your own version of it just by essentially changing your base graph. Another way that you can think about this is trying to think about how certain operations on graphs can change which vertex has um, the largest R star whenever we're thinking again of these independent sets as your, um, your family of sets that you're considering. And the reason why I like this question here, specifically when we are starting with the path as the as the um, base graph, is that if I were to connect all of the pendant vertices like this, what I get is the ladder graph, and it has been shown that the ladder graph is R E K R. So that makes me think, okay, if I took off those edges, how much harder would it be? Um, and so I guess that's. A question for you to answer, right? Can we prove 
uh, that those two vertices have the largest R star. But furthermore, you know, if we um, if that was pretty simple, can we then prove that um, this G star graph is R E K R for one value of R or for many values of R? So I hope you have some questions that you can take back with you and maybe work on yourself or work on with students at any level. But I appreciate you listening to this talk and I hope you have a wonderful day.